Hello everybody. I am once again elated that you chose to join us again. Um, let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, we come once again to study your word. We ask as always that you would open our hearts and our minds to receive your fresh. In Jesus name, amen. I am so happy that you chose to join us again. Uh, we are still on article number 11, which is the perseverance of saints. Our author writes, we believe that such only are real believers as endure until the end, that the persevering attachment to Christ is the grandmark which distinguishes them from superficial professors, that a special providence watches over their welfare, and that they are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation. And our main scripture continues to be John the 8th chapter, verses 31 and 32, which reads, To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Then you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And our focus continues to be on the latter part of verse 32, and the truth will set you free. And we are continuing on our third declaration of freedom. And if you don't know by now, I can stay on a, a subject a really long time. So we are continuing on freedom from discouragement, no frustration, which is found in Romans, the eighth chapter, verses 18 through 30. And today I will read verses 28 through 30 out of the NIV. And it reads, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the likeness of his son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. And let us not forget that uh, the, the, our discussion is based on verses 18 through 30. But for the sake of time, I shorten the readings to verses 28 through 30. But in the entirety of our verses, Paul makes the contrast between sufferings of this present time to the future glory, to the future hope of glory. And so everything that we've discussed thus far in the eighth chapter of Romans was a process to move us to the summit. So Paul, in a direct and detailed fashion, has taken us to the mountaintop. And up here on the mountain, we can look out and see the assurances of God without being distracted by the things that so easily cause us to take our eyes off the promises. On the island of Oahu in Hawaii, uh, there is a nearly circular crater called Diamond Head. It's approximately two-thirds of a mile and has an elevation of around 761 feet. It consists of winding trails, lots and lots of steps that are inside and outside of tunnels, and it's hot, at least in July. And it's a tourist attraction in one of their state parks. And so for the curious, or maybe for the crazy, or maybe for bragging rights, or maybe just to see the beauty, lots of people have climbed the mountain. Some call it brutal, but it is definitely doable. And the view at the top makes it so worth the momentary discomfort. At the summit, taking in the view and just breathing in the clean air, everything looks different. Even breathing is refreshing. 
Your instinct is to just exhale and take in as much as possible. You instantly forget the struggles of the climb and you're able to see the beauty without being distracted by the ground clutter. The amazing thing is, is that the beauty had been there all the time. It just required going to a higher elevation to see it. Paul in the 8th chapter of Romans have moved us to the summit. He says, those who love God and are called by him will definitely be freed from the bondage and corruption of this life. He, he is inviting us to go higher than our current situation, to look beyond the clutters of this world's problems and distractions and see our freedoms. We, we, we are freed from judgment. We are not condemned. We are freed from defeat. We have no obligation to the flesh. We're free from discouragement and frustration. We are being ushered into glory, into his beauty. We have that assurance from God. And it's so sure that we can live each day basking in the promise. It's like being on Diamond Head and only seeing the vast beauty. The, the beauty far exceeds the getting there. Everybody is glad they stuck it out. Nobody gets to the top and, and, and say, I wish I wasn't here. Everybody is glad to be there. It re remember the theme song on uh, Cheers, that old sitcom? It, it says, sometimes you want to go where everybody knows your name. And they're always glad you came. You want to be where you can see. Our troubles are all the same. You want to be where everybody knows your name. That's how it is on the summit. Everybody gives the newcomer an attaboy. We're glad you made it. People that you don't know, everybody is happy to see when, when, when a new person gets to the top. Everybody turns and like, Ah, I'm glad you got here. For believers, God gives us many assurances, many attaboys, many I'm glad you're here. He knows our name and he's always glad when we choose the mountaintop over the distractions. He assures us that his promises are good. One such promise or one such assurance is that God works things out for those who love him. God will overrule and work even through the tragedies caused by sin's presence in the world. He, he, to, to accomplish his purpose, he will, he will work through whatever needs to be worked through to accomplish his purposes in the lives of those who love him and who has responded to his call. We said last time that that should encourage us and give us comfort during difficult times. That is a great assurance. But as good as the promise is, there's always a but. There's a condition. God works things out for good only to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. The English Standard Version of uh, verse 28 drives this point home. It, it places the words to those who love God first in the sentence. It reads, and we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. The promise it is not for everybody. It can be, but it's not. It, it, it can be if everybody loved God, but that is not the case. God only looks after the affairs of the person who loves him. Think about it for a moment and, and reason with yourself. Who 
among us would commit to taking care of folk that are not our children and who wants nothing to do with us? We would call that crazy. And in some instances, we will call you a stalker. If a person does not love God, does not place his life into, in the hands of God, does not accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior, how can God take care of that person? That would be like trying to force a person to love you when they have done everything possible to say, I don't love you. If a person turns his back and walks away from God, how can God look after him? God is not going to force his care on us. He's not going to make us mechanical robots and force us to live at his beck and call. That's not love. We must choose to love God, not be made to love, to love him. God wants love that flows from a heart that chooses to love him. Who among us can't understand that? In the parable of the prodigal son, the father so loved the son, but the son chose to turn his back on the father. He, he chose to take himself out of the father's care. He chose to take himself out of the father's protection. Now, that didn't stop the father from loving the son. He loved him so much that he let him go, even though it broke his heart. He, he could have stopped the son, uh, knowing that he was headed for a world of pain and sorrow. But what good would that have done? It would have only made the son eventually hate the father. Even though the son left the father, the father never closed his heart to the son. He kept hoping. He kept praying for the son to come to himself. He kept looking down the road as far as the eye can see for the son to return. So much so that the Bible says in Luke, the 15th chapter, verse 20, it says, when he was still the, the son, when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. God is always looking. He's always waiting for whosoever will. And the great thing is that when we turn, even though we are yet a great way off, he will see us and have compassion on us. God wants us to choose him with our whole heart. He's already chosen us. He wants us to choose him. He chose us in the words of the preacher of old. He chose us even before there was a when or a where. God chose us. The message version of John 3.16 says, This is how much God loved the world. He gave his son his one and only son. And this is why. So that no one need to be destroyed by believing in him, anyone can have a whole and lasting life. Now, at this point, those of you who, who know me from our Sunday morning Bible study know that at times, I will take what I call a scenic route. You know how, how sometimes when you're on a road trip, you might see a sign that says scenic route. And, and, and you know, if you choose to take it, you can see a hidden gem that you would not have seen if you just remained on the road. Taking the route will add more time to the trip, but it is so worth it. And, and and you're always glad you did. Then at the end of the scenic route, it will connect you back to your main road. We're at such a place. And, and I've decided that we're going to take the scenic route. 
the message version of John 3 16 it, it says this is how much God loved the world he gave his son his one and only son and this is why so that no one need to be destroyed by believing in him anyone can have a whole and lasting life I, I know we are more familiar with the King James Version but the message version caused me to stop and take a closer look and, and it caused me to want to go around it and, and look at it and, and turn it over and, and just just deal with it how many times have you like me raced through that verse sometimes just to get it out my oldest son made a statement when he was young which was many many years ago uh, that has stuck with me throughout the years stuck with the family it's kind of one of those family things that everybody like yeah you remember this but but he said he said that sometimes it felt like his mouth was going off and leaving his brain I, I think that is how it is with us at times when we when it comes to John 3 16 we, we've heard it so much that it can easily run off our tongue without much thought of it in our brain. Have you ever paused to consider what it truly means? Have you ever pondered the depths of truth that's packed in it? Have you ever savored it like a fine dining experience that keeps on giving? That, that's what we're going to do. Savor it. Take the, the time to cut it with a knife. Put it in your mouth. Put the fork down. Put the knife down. Relax in your chair and actually chew it. Allow all of its juices to come together like a symphony in your mouth. But because it's late. And nobody wants to start a fine dining experience late in the evening when our digestive juices are shutting down for the night. So you got to come back next week. It's just got to come back next week. Let us pray. Most holy and gracious Father, once again, we said thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that you loved us so much thank you that you chose us and that no matter what you have chosen us and we said thank you now father as always we ask that you would show us what to do with what we've heard and then give us the courage to do it in jesus name amen well come back next week and join us as we take the scenic route to view the beauty of John 3.16. For now, goodbye. Stay safe. Wear your mask. Make sure you go back to the YouTube channel and, and look at all the messages that we put out there. And then come back next week and join us. Talk to you later. Goodbye.